Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Jack West, and I'm a Seattle-based medical oncologist hosting today's program co-sponsored by Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education, or GRACE, along with the Longevity Foundation. I was joined by Dr. Ramaswamy Govindan from Washington University in St. Louis and Dr. Julie Bramer from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. We'll continue with the second of the presentations by Dr. Bramer now. Thank you very much, Dr. West. Welcome, everyone. I get to talk about one of my favorite things, immunotherapy and lung cancer. So we're going to start off with ipilimumab or Yervoy, which was recently approved for melanoma treatment, but is also being studied in lung cancer. And then we'll talk about some other antibodies and then follow that with some viruses and then lastly talk about tilactoferrin. My disclosure, I am a consultant for BMS, but this is uncompensated, but you should know that. We're going to talk about immune checkpoints. Immune checkpoints are checkpoints that actually control how our T cells respond. First, we need one signal where the T cell, which is a lymphocyte or a type of white blood cell, that actually can recognize an antigen that our tumor cells will have on the cell surface or something called an antigen presenting cell that can present a protein or an abnormal substance such as what's made by a bacteria or a virus so that our T cells can recognize that this is not correct and should be targeted. Then that's followed by a second signal, which is a stimulatory signal that actually really activates the T cell in order to actually be able to attack the tumor or recognize what the antigen presenting cell is presenting to the T cell so that it can affect the virus or, again, the tumor. But then sometimes there is a signal that is a negative signal that will shut down the T cell. There are several different pathways that can shut down the T cell and stop the T cell from attacking the tumor. And one such pathway is something called CTLA-4. Basically, that can stop the T cell in its tracks and prevent it from attacking or recognizing that the tumor cell is there. An antibody to CTLA-4 can actually block that signal so that the T cell can actually remain activated and again attack the tumor cell. This antibody is called ipilimumab. This is currently the only antibody that is approved for use in cancer, and this is called Urovoy. And again, this was recently approved for use in melanoma. It is not yet approved for use in lung cancer, but it's being actively studied. Why is ipilimumab potentially important? Ipilimumab actually has evidence of broad range of activity in other tumors. Again, it's approved for use for melanoma, but it also has shown activity in other cancers as well. In general, Interestingly, ipilimumab has completely different side effects compared to chemotherapy. Basically, what it is trying to do is activate your immune system. Well, if you activate your immune system to attack the cancer, it can also attack normal cells as well. So the immune system is stimulated, so it can cause a rash or can cause something called colitis and cause diarrhea. It can affect your thyroid and other endocrine functions, and then it can also affect your liver. So these functions are closely monitored if you're on this type of therapy. But for patients who actually were in this melanoma study, ipilimumab by itself or with a vaccine actually improved how patients did, and this was the basis for the FDA approval in March of last year for patients with melanoma. But in lung cancer, it is being studied, and recently a phase two study was completed where two different ways of giving the ipilimumab were studied versus the chemotherapy by itself, and these were all in patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. It was also studied in small cell as well. But in non-small cell lung cancer, first in arm A, patients either were given ipilimumab and chemotherapy up front, and then if you did well after six cycles, patients were then put on maintenance ipilimumab. The arm B looked at chemotherapy by itself first, followed by the combination with ipilimumab, followed by maintenance, or just looking at chemotherapy by itself. 
Actually, this study showed an improvement in how patients did, particularly on this arm B. We're not exactly sure why these patients did well compared to the right up front combination, but patients tended to do better and live longer on this arm B, particularly the patients with squamous cell histology. We're not quite sure exactly why, but patients with squamous cell histology did better than patients with other subtypes of lung cancer. Based on this, there is a larger phase three trial specifically just for patients with squamous cell histology looking at combination of chemotherapy plus ipilimumab, particularly in this schedule where chemotherapy is given by itself, followed by the three drug combination and followed by ipilimumab as maintenance. Now, just to let you know, they have also looked at patients with small cell lung cancer in the same sort of regimen, and they plan to do a larger phase three trial combining ipilimumab with chemotherapy in small cell lung cancer as well. In general, the ipilimumab in lung cancer, the safety profile or the side effects from ipilimumab were similar to patients who were treated who had melanoma that we talked about previously. Combining it with chemotherapy did not seem to increase the side effects. The large phase three trial is planned, and I believe may be already open, looking at ipilimumab plus paclitaxel and carboplatinum, specifically in squamous cell carcinoma, and then patients with small cell lung cancer, the combination is looking at platinum plus etoposide plus ipilimumab. Now, it does take a village to control a T-cell. There's not just one particular signal that can shut down a T-cell or even cloak the tumor cell. Basically, how I look at it is that signal one is just to tell the T-cell, is this self or is this not self or is there something wrong with this cell? And signal two is a stimulatory cell, so basically putting on the gas for the T-cell. This signal, the CTLA-4 signal, is like putting on the brakes for your immune system. There are other signals that are also breaking signals for the immune system. The particular signal that we're going to focus on is this one, the PD-1 pathway. And again, this is basically like putting the brakes on your immune system, particularly on the immune system portion of the T cell. Now, this is another way of looking at this. Again, a little bit more complicated, but just looking at the fact that trying to control your immune system is very difficult. There's multiple pathways that turn it on and multiple pathways that turn it off. But one particular pathway that has been extremely interesting for us to look at is this PD-1 pathway. PD-1 is actually involved in your T cell control and expressed by some various different types of T cells. Basically, what it does is down-regulates or puts the brakes on the immune system, particularly on this type of T cell. So the thought is, if we have an antibody to block this pathway, instead of putting on the gas, we're just taking off the brakes. So potentially, blocking this pathway may have less side effects compared to putting on really stimulating your immune system and potentially will have some good activity against your tumor cells. How do we know that this PD-1 or PD-1 pathway is important? Well, we know that this is a potential way of tumors evading our immune system, and we think this is kind of a self-defense of how the tumors can defend themselves or cloak themselves from the immune system. Unfortunately, when your tumor is able to do this by expressing what the PD-1 receptor binds to, it's called PD-L1 or a ligand on the cell surface, it can mean that in general it's poor prognostic, patients don't do as well. However, there might be some interesting notes that I'll talk about a little bit more that it might actually help us guide our treatment down the road. We see this expression both in patients with adenocarcinoma as well as squamous cell carcinoma, and this is just an example of your tumor cell expressing this ligand, the PD-L1, on the tumor surface here, if you can see that here. And this is a patient with lung cancer that does express this ligand on its cell surface. This is a trial of an antibody that blocks that pathway. This is a drug or antibody that does not even have a name yet. It's called BMS936558. Another name for it used to be MDX1106. This trial just recently finished accrual. 
This antibody is given by vein once every two weeks, and patients are continued on the treatment unless their disease progresses. If they have stable disease or responding disease, they continue on up to a total of 96 weeks. Various different dose schedules were tested. All these doses were found to be safe. Patients included in this trial included several different tumor types, but particularly interesting is the non-small cell lung cancer group. Now, these trial results were presented back in 2010, the early portion of this trial. This antibody seems quite safe. As we increased the dose, the side effects did not increase. The most common side effects were fatigue and skin rash. There was occasional diarrhea seen, but was quite manageable. And again, with this type of antibody, you can see those itises. You can see a rash. You can see diarrhea. You can see changes in thyroid hormone levels. But all of these seem to be relatively easy controlled. Now, this was presented in 2010. Early activity in non-small cell lung cancer has been seen. We have seen patients' tumors respond to this antibody. And certainly not all patients respond to this. But when we do see a response, It has been wonderful to see, and patients seem to tolerate this well. Again, at the time of this presentation back in 2010, we had one patient that had been on study for over a year, and that patient had remained on study now over two years. And we have some other patients that have responded as well. Based on this early information, actually a part of this trial was expanded specifically for patients with non-small cell lung cancer. Patients were entered into the trial specifically with just non-small cell lung cancer and either started on the 1 milligram per kilogram dose, the 3 milligram per kilogram dose, or a 10 milligram per kilogram dose. Now, this recently completed accrual, and we hope that this will be presented this year at ASCO, and we'll be able to give you a better hint about what the responses truly have been in this much larger group of patients than what was presented in 2010. Based on some of the early results, we did combine chemotherapy with the antibody to see how safe it was to combine with chemotherapy. This trial is a phase one trial, again, looking at the safety of the combination, and patients actually have been enrolled, and this one arm with gemcitabine and cisplatinum is still open to patients with squamous cell histology. These other arms have finished accrual. Now, there's another way of blocking this pathway. This top is a way that the anti-PD-1 antibody blocks this pathway, and so basically taking off the brakes of the immune system. There's another antibody that, instead of blocking the receptor here, it actually blocks this, the ligand on the tumor cell. So these two different antibodies block the signal just two different ways. That gets us to another antibody called BMS 936559, and this is an anti pdl one antibody blocking the same pathway but differently because this is blocking the ligand on the tumor cell that the PD-1 receptor is supposed to bind to, but again, this blocks this. This is an early phase one study, just looking at patients with five different tumor types and also specifically looking at patients with non-small cell lung cancer. This antibody is given similarly like the last one, once every two weeks. Thus far, It seems that this antibody is well tolerated. An expanded cohort of patients with non-small cell lung cancer are also being looked at in this trial. We hope that results will be presented at ASCO this year. Now, let's change gears and actually fight our cancer with a biology and specifically looking at anti-cancer viruses. We're going to just talk briefly about something called Reolysin and another one called SVV001. Real lysin is actually an oncolytic virus. This virus can enter cancer cells and cause a response or destruction of the tumor cell, and it also stimulates the immune system to attack the cancer areas. There is a study that was ongoing. It was a phase one that was followed by a phase two, combining the virus with chemotherapy, looking at response rates. This is a very early trial with only 36 patients. 
specifically, they are looking at patients with squamous cell histology. They have seen some patients with responses. These are just looking at different tumor types, looking at different KRAS mutant or KRAS non-mutant patients, and they have seen some patients respond. This is very early and not very many patients studied, but the response rate of seven patients out of 28 thus far seems encouraging, but again, quite early. This is just another way that we're trying to figure out how to fight cancer with different ways such as viruses and thus also using the immune system. Another virus called SVV001 is actually a different type of virus that actually targets tumors with neuroendocrine features. This specifically is for patients with potentially carcinoid or small cell lung cancer. This was a phase one trial that was performed and it was felt that it was safe because of the safety and some interesting results. A phase two study of this virus is being performed in ECOG, specifically for small cell lung cancer, taking patients with metastatic small cell lung cancer after chemotherapy if they have stable disease or using the virus to see if we can keep patients' tumors under control much longer compared to what the standard is, is just following them over time until they would recur. So we hope that the virus will keep patients' tumors under check, using the virus to attack the tumor directly, but also trying to stimulate the immune system to actually recognize the tumor as well. This is just the response seen using this SVV001 in a patient with small cell lung cancer. You can see here pretreatment, the tumor in the right lung, and then six weeks after, the response that are seen. And also being able to demonstrate that the virus actually gets into the areas of tumor, and this was a liver biopsy, showing that the virus is present in the cancer in the liver, that it was a metastasized, and then not evident in the normal liver next to it. Lastly, that gets us to telactoferrin. Lactoferrin in general is an important immunomodulatory protein. It's expressed throughout the body in immune cells and on body surfaces that are exposed to the external environment such as your GI tract. It is actually found in high concentrations in mother's milk or colostrum and plays a role in establishing the immune system, particularly in the GI tract, basically called the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, so basically your lymph system along your GI tract, otherwise called the GALT. This telactoferrin, or TLF, is actually a recombinant human lactoferrin. It's a protein that is produced by a particular type of fungus, but it has the similar activity compared to lactoferrin. Theoretically, how we think it may work is that this telactoferrin is taken by mouth. It acts on the GI cell surface to release something called chemokines. And basically, chemokines are things that can stimulate the immune system and call in the immune system. Particularly, the thought is that it calls in something called dendritic cells. These cells are antigen-presenting cells like we talked about before. They're recruited into the GI tract. They undergo maturation. They're turned on. They help initiate the response of some other cells to attack the tumor cells as well as something called CD8-positive lymphocytes, which are some T cells. So we think that by stimulating, these other cells are stimulated, and then they go throughout your system and will attack the tumor cells. Now, that's all theory, and we hope that we can see activity. Now, in some Phase two studies in lung cancer, telactoferrin was given in patients who had been previously treated, and this was compared to placebo. It did show a hint of overall improvement in how patients did compared to placebo. If you looked at these two different survival curves, patients with telactoferrin compared to not doing therapy except best supportive care, patients seem to live longer and do better. But again, this is a quite small study. This also showed that patients who were given the telactoferrin, their cancer was controlled at a higher rate compared to those patients who were not receiving telactoferrin. 
also interesting, it seemed that the tolactoferrin worked both on the non-squamous cell histology as well as the patients with squamous cell histology. But these numbers, again, are extremely small, as you can see down here. So we don't have a great idea of how it would work in the larger patient population. There's another study where tolactoferrin was combined with chemotherapy, and again, this is a smaller phase two study, and this is taking patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer and giving them either tolactoferrin with chemotherapy or chemotherapy by itself. In this study, the main endpoint was to try to see if patients' tumors could respond much better if the tolactoferrin was combined with chemotherapy versus chemotherapy by itself. And there was a trend towards an improvement in response when given together versus the chemotherapy by itself. Lastly, in this small group of patients, there was a trend towards an improvement in survival, but that was not significantly different in these two survival curves. Based on some of the hints of improvement when patients were given tolactoferrin, this is an oral therapy. Some larger phase three trials are planned or underway. One study is, again, tolactoferrin in patients who had been previously treated with other types of chemotherapy. This is a large study looking at tolactoferrin by itself. Then there is another study that is combining tolactoferrin with chemotherapy up front in patients who have never been treated as well. So this is just giving you a flavor of what's going on. None of these agents are approved for use for lung cancer specifically. Ipilimumab is probably one of the farthest down the path of development in lung cancer since it's already approved for use in melanoma patients. Certainly the BMS antibodies to PD-1 as well as PD-1, I think, show some promising activity in non-small cell lung cancer. The viruses, the real lysin for patients with lung cancer, as well as the non-small cell lung cancer patients, as well as SVV001 for patients for small cell lung cancer, are a novel way of fighting cancer and also using the immune system. And then lastly, lactoferrin, which theoretically could boost your immune system in a completely different way, may be an interesting agent to watch as well in the near future. We'll cover the question and answer session for this program in our next podcast. Thanks for listening. If you like and learn from our Grace Cast, you can subscribe on iTunes by just searching for the term Cancer Grace, find podcasts in the subject you want, pick a format of audio or video, and then just click subscribe. It's that easy. And for those of you who don't want to miss any of our programs, there's even a feed for all subjects. You can also find us on YouTube at Grace for Cancer Info, and that's the number four in one word, Grace for Cancer Info. Finally, if you haven't been there yet, please check out our Grace website at www.cancergrace.org. And don't forget that donate button in the upper right. Our content, which helps tens of thousands of cancer patients around the world every month, is made possible by your support. Thanks again.